there are dates in all of our lives that stand out, that give shape to who we are, that give a sense of identity or purpose or destiny, that for good reasons and sometimes for sad reasons give a molding to our very being. Now, I happen to come from a family that is very good about remembering dates. All three of my brothers are, in fact, are, are ridiculous about remembering dates. Uh, every single morning, one of them initiates a group text between the four brothers telling us that on this day we remember the birthday of Marquis de Lafayette or the signing of such and such a treaty or when the movie The Searchers was released and so forth. So we, we like dates in my family. And as I look back on my life, there are a bunch that stand out, that gave shape to my very being. I think, for example, of June 16th, 1984, when I had the very good fortune to marry a young woman named Jan. Or the next year, on June 15th and December 21st of 1985, when respectively I was ordained to the diaconate and then the priesthood. Or July 1st, that same year, when I began serving in my first congregation. There is May 2nd, 1981, when after singing, to brag a little bit, a small solo on the stage of Carnegie Hall, the Chicago Symphony and Chorus, I realized that I wasn't called to be a singer, but was in fact called to be a priest. June 2nd, 1998, when I received my doctorate. Some of the dates were sad, as I said. There was February 13th, 1986, when my beloved maternal grandmother died at the age of 96, or May 16th, 1993, when my father died too young, too quickly. There are a few other dates in there as well, including, for example, March 1st, 2011, when I came back to Holy Comforter as rector. And then, of course, maybe for all of us, November 2nd, 2016, when, against all odds, the Cubs finally won the World Series. Do you notice, though, there is one day that I didn't mention, but I remember it. I don't remember it consciously, so to speak, but I know the date, and that was May 29th, 1959, when, in the tiny church of St. John the Divine in Garden Grove, Iowa, at the hands of Father Charlie Fletcher, I was baptized baptized into the household of God, into the community of faith, into the family of Christ. Now, it's worth mentioning that, in fact, that church no longer exists. I was the very last baby baptized there, and I'll let you sort of work out what that might mean. It's also worth mentioning that I am maybe the only person I know who actually possesses the baptismal font in which he was baptized. It's actually just a small, dented, tarnished Paul Revere bowl but when the church closed, it went to my grandmother, and then to my mom, and now to me. And every now and then, as I'm going through things, I'll come across that old Paul Revere bowl, and I'll ponder for a moment my baptism, which, as I said, I don't remember, but which I know the date and all the details. Because it is from that day that all the other days flow. It is from that identity-bestowing moment that the rest of my journey takes shape. We are here today to celebrate the feast of the baptism of our Lord and to enjoy the great delight of welcoming four new siblings into the family of faith. And this is an important day. This baptism of our Lord is an important day because it brings us face to face with a critical reality about Jesus' life. To be honest, the baptism of Jesus is an event that has troubled scholars and theologians and preachers and priests for nearly 2,000 years. Because if Jesus truly was without sin, if he was perfection personified as we've always been taught, then why did he need to go to the baptism of repentance to which John the Baptist was calling the people of Judea of Israel? Why did Jesus who was without sin, need to be cleansed of sin. And so people, preachers and scholars, and theologians have wrestled with this for a long time. And in fact, if you look at the four different Gospels in the New Testament, each one handles this moment differently. 
There's almost a sense in which, to be honest, there's a little bit of embarrassment, or like, we're not sure how to deal with this or what to say about it, so we're just going to give you some sort of sketchy details. And the four, as I say, do differ. As one of my favorite authors said, if somebody tells you something that it is not in their best interest for you to know, it's probably true. And so the baptism of Jesus, as troubling as it might be from a theological standpoint, is nevertheless an iconic moment in his life. The reality is we are just a week or so into the season of Epiphany, the season where there is a constant unfolding, revealing, manifesting of who Jesus is. Is. It began with the annunciation of the angel in that private moment to Mary, and then the repetition of that same annunciation to Joseph. It took form, human form, when Jesus was incarnated in that humble setting in Bethlehem. His identity as the Holy One of God was confirmed by the angels who sang sweetly from the clouds and by the shepherds who gambled across the plains to see this child. And then those three exotic visitors from the East, those wise men, came bearing their strange gifts, affirming that this child was holy beyond all others. And this entire season of Epiphany is a continuing series of unfolding moments where Jesus' identity as the Holy One of God is revealed. Like layer by layer, step by step, we see more broadly, more deeply, more richly who he was. And his baptism was the first public moment as an adult when Jesus' identity was affirmed, confirmed, and appropriated. And so perhaps that's why he was baptized. Not because he needed the baptism of repentance, but because in that very act, as he was about to inaugurate his public ministry, Jesus chose sides. Jesus chose to be identified with the very people he had come to claim, to renew, to bring back to God. Jesus could very easily have stood on the banks of the Jordan shouting encouragement to the sinners going into the water. He could have preached another eloquent sermon as he did several times. He could have worked some marvel or wonder, but he didn't. Instead, he chose chose to enter into the water of the farm, of the river so that there he might be fully, completely identified with the very people he had come to serve and save and love. And in that regard, as Jesus went into the water, he promised to go with us wherever we go, into the dark and scary and joyful and lovely moments of our lives into those places where we need the presence of the Holy One, the Holy Spirit. He promised always to be our companion, not as one aloof and distant, but as one who marched through the very experiences that we experience. And not about you, I find great comfort in that. That the one who heals and renews and saves is one who has experienced our very reality. For anyone who has, for example, wrestled with pride, or the temptation to seek status or standing. How comforting it is to know that Jesus faced those same enticements and turned his back on them. For those of us grieving the death of a loved one, how comforting to remember that Jesus wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus and felt that very sorrow that we feel. For those of us who have, perhaps at different times, been nudged aside by the world or felt like outcasts or persecuted in some way or oppressed, again, what a source of strength to know that those experiences were not alien or foreign to Jesus because he encountered all of them. So in the baptism, at the very beginning of his public ministry, Jesus chooses size, chooses to be identified with God, yes, but chooses to be identified with us with us. And that ultimately is what our baptisms mean too, isn't it? That we choose to be identified with the one who has chosen us. And that's why whenever we celebrate a baptism, as we get the great joy today to do, we all renew our own baptismal covenant. And I know it's probably tempting sometimes just to go through the words in a rote fashion. 
but we are reminded every time we celebrate a baptism of why we do it. We are called to confess our faith in Father, Son, and Spirit. We pledge to take our place at God's holy table and to be nourished by God's holy meal. We promise that we will seek and serve the Christ in each other and all people. That we will work for justice, for peace, for love. That we will re-choose to be identified with the one who has chosen us. That's what happens when we renew our baptismal covenant, and it takes us back to our own baptismal moments when, for many of us, we were too young to know what was happening. But promises were made on our behalf, just as we do so today for our four new siblings, that we will work to be God's people, enlivened by God's Spirit, loving in God's name. Baptism is not magic. Baptism is not death insurance. Baptism is not a societal norm or simply something that is done to us. Baptism is our act of choosing God who has chosen us. It is our act of saying we go into the water just as Jesus did so that we might rise to new life just as Jesus did. And the third century theologian Tertullian said we only live by remaining in the water. Isn't that a wonderful image? We only live by keeping one foot in the font or the river or the lake or the stream. That that connection to our baptism shapes everything else about who we are and our relationship with the one who has chosen us. Baptism is a time of great joy and delight and an opportunity for us to remember who we are. But it's also a chance, especially today, to remember that when Jesus was baptized, what was the first thing that happened when he came out of the water? The dove descended as a sign of the presence of the Spirit, and then that voice from heaven, the voice of God saying, this is my Son, the Beloved. Jesus is given a new name, a new identity. He enters the font a carpenter, he exits the river, a Messiah. He is given the name Beloved. And that's the name we were given when we were baptized. That's the name we are going to give our four new siblings in just a minute. Beloved. Beloved of God who for whatever reason, sometimes against rhyme or reason, looks at us and is well pleased. We are given in baptism the identity that Jesus was given, that of being the beloved of God, called to seek and serve Christ, called to love and proclaim the good news of God, called to reach out to the forgotten and the broken and the outcast, called to embrace the forgotten, called to love the unlovely and unlovable. And all because of our new identity, our new name. And is it remarkable? Is it impossible to believe that in fact, at our baptisms, at the baptism today, every time we renew our vows, God calls us once again, beloved, my beloved daughter, my beloved son. And likewise, looks at us and says, with you, I am well pleased.